Hi everyone, my name is Rianvi Mazmidi, and today we are going to be talking about, um, first of all, some uh, notable worldwide outbreaks. So we're starting off with pinnacosis, um, particularly in the Eastern European region. So pinnacosis is the result of a bacterial infection uh, from Chlamydia filia psittaci, which generally affects those in contact with pet birds, poultry workers, and veterinarians, and gardeners. So transmission generally occurs via inhalation of airborne particles from the bird secretions, and symptoms can include fever, headache, and cough. Now, psittacosis is treatable by prompt antibiotic treatment, and public health response generally, um, to right now at least, um, includes surveillance, epidemiological investigations, and national reporting. WHO, the World Health Organization, um, advises increased clinician awareness for testing, as well as quarantine measures for sick birds and promoting good hygiene practices, again, to reduce the chance of transmission. As far as current U.S. outbreaks go, um, there hasn't been anything new reported since last month's Listeria outbreak um, from Cody McKees and um, from Hazel Driscoll, and also um, Salmonella from Charter Avians. So with that, I'm going to start talking about healthcare accessibility beyond the waiting room. So a little bit about me. Again, my name is Ruby Mazzini, and I'm a sophomore at James Logan High School here in Union City, California. Talking about some of my personal pursuits or extracurricular activities, I'm a cancer researcher. In fact, I recently collaborated with Harvard University faculty members on a meta-analysis of the mTOR complexes. I'm also a mental health advocate, and last month I actually presented on social media and its effects on mental health. Um, I'm also a lead presenter here at the Youth Public Health Forum, as well as an active hospital and student volunteer photographer. Alright, so with that, we'll talk about a brief overview of today's presentation. So we're going to start about the background of this, so talking about the barriers to healthcare access, focusing on some of the socioeconomic, the geographical, and even some of the cultural and linguistic barriers to healthcare access. Then we'll discuss preventative care. What exactly is it, and as well as its importance, education, and stigma surrounding preventative care in the youth. Then we'll discuss some of the new innovations to promote access to healthcare. So talking about telehealth, digital health, school-based health centers, as well as community-based outreach programs. And then we'll finally wrap up with a discussion on policy and advocacy. So analyzing some of the more recent healthcare policies, youth advocacy, as well as discussing the importance of collaborative approaches. All right, so with that, let's talk about what healthcare accessibility is. So healthcare accessibility basically refers to the ease with which individuals can obtain healthcare services when needed. And that can include not just the physical access to healthcare facilities, but also the affordability of, of these services, the availability of the providers, and the cultural and linguistic appropriateness of care. What's interesting is that of our roughly 9 million population, nearly 4.5 billion people lack access to healthcare, essentially half the population. And in America alone, nearly 25.6 million individuals are actually uninsured, which again affects their ability to access timely and effective healthcare. Interestingly enough, while 20% of the US population lives in rural areas, only 9% of our physicians actually practice in those areas, again affecting individuals' ability to access timely, affordable, and efficient healthcare. So here on the screen are a couple of the more um, prevalent healthcare um, insurance companies and such. And um, a lot of people actually can't afford these insurances or the premiums from them. Again, why socioeconomic factors is such a big thing to analyze when we're talking about healthcare barriers. So when we talk about socioeconomic factors, it's a really, it's an umbrella category. So this includes income level, educational level, um, as well as just overall socioeconomic status, which can profoundly affect healthcare accessibility. Low income individuals uh, generally face financial burdens uh, when it comes to accessing healthcare. So that basically includes costs associated with medical services, medications, and as we talked about in the previous slide, insurance coverage. So the lack of health insurance or even underinsurance, of course, can result in delayed or foregone medical care. Higher levels of education are often associated with better health outcomes as individuals are generally more aware of the healthcare utilization, the different options they have, and just general health literacy. Again, individuals from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds may experience limited access to healthcare, transportation challenges, and also inadequate health infrastructure, which leads us into a discussion of the geographic barriers to healthcare. So geographic barriers especially are impacting these rural populations, where challenges can be related to distance, uh, transportation, and even just general availability to healthcare infrastructure. Rural areas, like we talked about in the beginning, often face shortages of healthcare providers, and that includes physicians, specialists, and other healthcare professionals. Limited availability to 
healthcare facilities and services will result in longer time delays and travel times and access and medical care. Oftentimes, when individuals need surgeries to be performed in these rural areas, the, low, the nearest surgical center will be two or three hours away. And obviously, that's going to impact their ability to get this efficient and uh, yeah, this efficient care. So then we discuss these sort of cultural and linguistic barriers uh, to healthcare accessibility. Um, the first and foremost, obviously, is English proficiency. It can impede communication between healthcare providers and their patients. In fact, in 2016, a survey of roughly 4,800 hospitals found that only 56% offer some form of cultural and linguistic uh, translation services. And at that point, only 26% of the um, individuals surveyed actually reported that they were satisfied with the availability of these services. So cultural beliefs, practices, and attitudes toward healthcare can also influence perceptions of illness and treatment. Oftentimes, indigenous populations or immigrant populations don't trust American healthcare again because of these sort of cultural stigmas that they have towards it. Um, again, that's why culturally sensitive care that respects these diverse beliefs and values is critical for building trust uh, within healthcare services. An analysis of actually 14 US-based studies revealed that 66.7% of LEPPs, or limited English proficient patients, reported that they had a barrier to accessing healthcare. 20% actually reported that they did not seek healthcare services if there was, they were not available, or for fear um, of this sort of lack of understanding and thus facing some sort of um, racial discrimination or such because of it. So now we're gonna start talking about preventative care. What exactly is it? So preventative care can basically include vaccinations and screenings basically to help catch diseases before they occur. And even early detection through preventative care can lead to better treatment outcomes and thus increase individuals' chances of recovery. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, reported that using preventative care efficiently can actually save over 100,000 lives annually. And this basically includes early screenings for things such as cancer, diabetes, and hypertension. So the WHO actually reports that preventative interventions can significantly reduce the burden of diseases worldwide as well. And the NIH, um, the National Institute on Health, reported that a full, nine, even just a 90% delivery rate of primary preventative services could reduce healthcare expenditure, expenditures nationally by nearly $53.9 billion. So how do we introduce the youth? How do we educate the youth about preventative care? So health education basically empowers our people to take knowledge about preventative care and to take that knowledge and really encourage themselves um, to take these proactive steps um, to protect their health again. So again, the NIH reported that the, uh, health education programs in school can actually positively influence health behaviors among adolescents. So again, by ed educating these young people about it, we can encourage them to prioritize regular health screenings and checkups. Providing them with information can empower them to make their own informed decisions about health and it can also help to bridge the gap between knowledge and action, again, empowering these individuals to really take advantage of their resources and to take full control of their own health care needs. And talking about destigmatization efforts, as we talked about earlier, um, the GAA, the, GAA, um, the Journal of Adolescent Health, actually suggests that stigma related to mental health and reproductive health care can often be significant barriers to care for adolescents. Promoting destigmatization efforts, again, will involve raising awareness, um, challenging um, misconceptions, and also creating a very supportive environment for young people to seek health care. So that's why counselors are such a big, important, um, big and important part of this. Um, Community-based interventions and public health campaigns, as we'll discuss later on in the presentation, do play a critical role in reducing stigma and, again, promoting acceptance of these healthcare-seeking behaviors. And it's also important to, again, establish these safe and non-judgmental spaces um, to educate people and also culturally, uh, to promote culturally sensitive and youth-friendly healthcare practices. All right, so now we're going to be talking about some of the innovations in uh, promoting access to healthcare. The first and foremost comes telehealth and digital health. So digital health is basically the utilization of information and communication technologies to improve health outcomes in patient care. And that includes telehealth, uh, mobile health, wearable devices. So it's not just wearable sensors, but also things even such as your Apple, um, your Apple Watch, which can track these sort of different metrics, information technology, and also telemedicine. So telehealth itself is basically the utilization of technology to provide remote clinical healthcare services, which is why it's actually such a big thing in these rural populations, again, to promote that sort of patient-doctor um, interaction. 
Um, according to a recent uh, survey by the AMA, the American Medical Association, dental tooth utilization has actually increased by nearly 12% uh, between 2020 and 2021, again among these populations. Studies actually show that remote monitoring through digital health uh, platforms has led to nearly a 50% uh, percent reduction in readmission or even remissions for chronic conditions such as heart disease and heart failure. 70% of patients actually report high satisfaction rates with virtual consultations, citing convenience and reduced wait times as primary benefits. Again, it's another way for individuals to have this sort of continued support by their healthcare professionals and these facilities. Another big thing that we see nowadays is also school-based health centers, like the one that's at my school, James Logan High School. So these, HBH, uh, these SBHCs are basically healthcare centers for students in you know, pre-K through grade 12, which promote primary care services to address their physical and mental health needs. Common services are generally like basic uh, care and checkups, so physicals, um, tooth and eye examinations, scoliosis screenings, uh, strep tests, flu shots, and many more of a similar, brand, of a similar um, so at these um, school-based health centers basically provide healthcare services to over 2 million students annually in the United States, according to the School-Based Alliance Health Alliance. And again, these centers, like we saw earlier, offer a wide range of services, and that kind of uh, shows students that they have access to all these uh, opportunities and kind of to take advantage of them. And studies have actually shown that having these school-based health centers can improve attendance rates and also improve academic performance. So as we talk about um, all these sort of things, it's important to also note community outreach programs. Community outreach programs have been very successful in reaching these underserved youth populations with outreach efforts targeting rural, low-income, and minority communities. Again, also kind of destigmatizing healthcare and promoting you know, cultural, linguistic um, interactions and removing those barriers. So these programs basically provide health education workshops, screenings, and preventative care services to promote health literacy and preventative care among adolescents. Community outreach programs can also identify certain geographic regions that may face higher levels of need or significant barriers toward um, you know, living healthy lifestyles. So as we begin to wrap up, I want to talk about policy and advocacy for healthcare. So it is critical to examine these existing healthcare policies and the regulations that impact access to care for young people. Advocating um, policy changes where necessary to address these barriers to access and also kind of promoting these um, advocacy groups and organizations. We also have to raise awareness about healthcare issues among adolescents, as well as advocate for policy reforms to improve these access to healthcare services. Um, it's also important to uh, emphasize the importance of collaboration between these stakeholders or the big players, I guess you could say, in healthcare. So that fields policymakers, the healthcare providers, community organizations, as well as individuals themselves. We have to work together to address and slowly break down these barriers in healthcare access. And hence, and hence it is imperative to um, implement holistic solutions for improved healthcare access among young people. All right, so quick Q&A session, if there are any questions from the audience. All right. um, so again, thank you to the Youth Public Health Forum and the New York Library for giving me the chance to present my work, um, and as well as the forum's previous student speakers for their informative presentations. And again, this presentation would not be possible without the work of the countless researchers, um, physicians, and healthcare professionals, as well as the public health professionals um, working to raise awareness of um, healthcare accessibility and really break down these barriers. So here's some of my references if any of you are interested to check these out. Um, and yeah, so up next we have a presentation by Eric Sue on tuberculosis.